Hello, everyone. We meet on World Environment Day. Let's not forget that. It may be the 10th anniversary of TEDx, but it is World Environment Day. And I would like to use this opportunity to talk about what Antarctica can teach us about how we can manage an issue like climate change. And I thought I'd draw on some of the things I've learned from retracing the journey of a guy called Ernest Shackleton's expedition, his original expedition being described as the greatest survival journey of all time. We did it the same way that he did with the old 100-year-old technology. And I think there's some wonderful learnings you can take that can really be usefully applied to an issue like climate change, which is overwhelming for so many of us. In terms of the Antarctic, I, it's, it's a massive place, and it's being heavily impacted by climate change. What I don't want to spend my 12 minutes doing is telling you all about the statistics around climate change, the fact that we have raised global temperatures by one degree Celsius in the 20th century, that we're on course for another three degrees Celsius if we remain on the same trajectory that we're on, that we have the highest levels of CO2 in the atmosphere that we've had for 400,000 years, that the ocean is 30% more acidic than it was in 1750, largely due to the fossil fuels that we are releasing into the atmosphere. And that of the three millimeters of global sea level rise that we are experiencing as a result of human-induced climate change, that one millimeter of it comes from things like the thing behind me. One millimeter comes from the melting of the western part of Antarctica. That thing behind me is B15A, the largest iceberg ever to break off Antarctica. 195 kilometers long, 37 kilometers wide, 800 meters thick not the size of Belgium like these things so often are, but 15 times the size of Singapore, just to give you some indication of the scale of what it is that we are actually dealing with. When Sir Ernest Shackleton went to Antarctica, his goal was to cross Antarctica from one side to the other. These are my tracks coming out of the screen towards you. Still 600 kilometers from the South Pole when I took this shot. In the background is a mountain 1,000 meters bigger than Mount Kosciuszko. Only the top 100 meters sticks out of the 3,000 meter thickness of ice in that part of Antarctica. From a climate change perspective, we have everything to be fearful of with Antarctica. In the event that the whole lot were to melt, we would have 70 meters of global sea level rise because Antarctica is twice the size of Australia. It is covered in an average thickness of 2,000 and 50 meters. Australia is seven and a half million square kilometers. Antarctica is 14 million. 14 million times two. My maths isn't that good, but I think that's 28 million cubic kilometers of ice. 97% of the world's water is in the ocean. And the remaining 3%, 2% is in the Antarctic. And 7.3 billion of us survive on the remaining 1%. And quarter of that is in Lake Baikal in northern Russia which means 7.3 billion of us survive on 0.75% of the world's available water, which is why the next conflict might well be about water. Shackleton's goal was to cross this thing one side to the other. He went down in his ship, the Endurance, the strongest ice strengthened vessel of the period, and everything went wrong right from the outset. Ship got stuck in the ice. This is back in 1915. It was stuck for 10 months until finally the pressure of ice pushed in around the hull of the vessel, cracked, cracked the vessel open, and down she went. Shackleton and his 27 men were left stranded for 10 months initially in the stricken ship and then a further five months living on the pack ice in a succession of precarious camps. Shackleton's leadership is universally attributed as having saved them from the circumstances they found themselves in. I could talk about Shackleton at great length, but I won't. But I think the one key take home from him that's really relevant to an issue like climate change is the fact that he understood the teams are made up of individuals. If you want to get a group of individuals to pull together as one to achieve a singular goal, arguably a definition of leadership, you've got to understand everybody is different. Their motivations are different. If you want to get them all to pull as one, you need to approach them with a different version of the story that you think will resonate with them, that will change their behavior. Why then do we just use guilt and fear to try and instill action in people when it comes to an issue like climate change, when there are so many other tools, so many other motivations, so many positive motivations, financial motivations even, that we can use to get a change in behavior. Something that needs to be done. My, my, my neighbor does not believe in climate change, but he is interested in his electricity bill going down, and I installed a solar, a solar system on his roof that saved his energy and got the climate change outcome I wanted without any need to talk about the moral dimension of the argument. Shackleton lived on the stricken ship for 10 months, a further five months on the pack ice. One night the pack ice broke up. What do you do in that situation? You take the lifeboats 
under which you've been sheltering. You turn them the right way up and you paddle them to the nearest land you can reach, which for him was a place called Elephant Island. He and his men fell ashore. They celebrated. But Shackleton knew that no one would find them there and the only thing for it was to go on another mission, a rescue mission to try and reach civilization or the nearest thing to it where he could raise the alarm and send a bigger ship south to pick up the men he'd left behind. The nearest place was a place called South Georgia, another remote island. Off he went on a journey which is quite unbelievable against all the odds using traditional navigation, a sextant in a, a, a pitching boat in the roughest ocean in the world. He reached South Georgia, raised the alarm, and saved everyone. How does one make an expedition like this happen when you're asked to do it 100 years on the same way he did? You don't do it by just vaguely going in that direction. You use what they call backwards mapping, where you say, this is the objective I want to try and achieve, and these are the steps required to achieve it. Why then, with the international climate change dialogue, do we have an aspirational goal of one and a half degrees Celsius beyond which we must not warm the planet? All the countries get together, they put together their commitments, Someone smarter than me aggregates their total commitment and realizes we don't get to one and a half degrees, we don't get to two degrees, we get to three and a half degrees. We missed the target by more than the amount we've already warmed the planet as a result of the last 250 years of fossil fuel burning. I don't call that a success. That wouldn't work in an expedition. Why should it work with an issue like climate change? Backwards mapping, put in place the things you need to get done in order to achieve the goal you set for yourself. The boat. We rebuilt his boat just as per the original, a keelless seven-meter rowboat, frankly very precarious for the Southern Ocean. I had backers, I had Discovery Channel backing the expedition. I assumed in the fortnightly phone hookups to chart my progress on the expedition planning that they want to see the budgets and the risk assessment and things like that. They only wanted to see pictures of the boat. Why is that? We are evidence-based creatures. Seeing is believing. Humans need to see things. Why is climate change so difficult to communicate? Because you can't see CO2 in the atmosphere. What does 400 parts per million mean to anybody when you can't see it? You need to find something that speaks to the person whose behavior you're seeking to change, a proxy for it. You need to find your Shackleton boat if you want to convince yourself and others to change behavior. It must be something that actually means something to them. Life on the Southern Ocean in a 23-foot, seven-meter-long, keelless rowboat boat with six guys sharing the equivalent space of a queen-size double bed, sleeping on top of rocks designed to stop the boat from capsizing in the massive sea state that we experience, wearing non-waterproof clothing, eating lard for sustenance, trying to reach a little dot in the ocean, South Georgia, 100 years after Shackleton, ain't much fun. It is a seasickness-inducing, unbelievably fetid environment as you're sitting in a vomit-encrusted reindeer skin sleeping bag with only 15 millimeters of larch planks that separate you from the one degree Celsius of the Southern Ocean. Survival time, less than 10 minutes if you should fall in. It ain't for everybody. How do you get through it? You break the enormity of the challenge down into small pieces. If that's not a metaphor for climate change, I don't know what is. You take a massive challenge and you break it down into small pieces and you work through the achievement of those small milestones until you get to the outcome that you seek. In the knowledge that you might need to change tack, we were pushed off course many, many times. And the what it is you're trying to achieve remains fixed. The how you get there, get there may need to change in accordance with the landscape. Don't allow your view to be fixed. Adjust on the run and adjust accordingly and still achieve the outcome that you seek. You need the right people. We had six miserable guys just like the original. I wanted a female skipper, but I was overridden by the Shackleton family, but them's the breaks. But this, what suffice to say that me as an expedition leader of these things, all I am really is an enabler. It's the team that gets the job done. And we've had a government here elected that perhaps is not to everybody's taste when it comes to dealing with an issue like climate change. Let's not get political. But suffice to say, they're really only, only an enabling environment. We are the ones who have to make the changes. It's our purchasing decisions and the energy we consume at home and how we get to work and how much flying we do and the meat that we eat or choose not to eat that makes the difference between whether or not we can address an issue like climate change or not. As Anita Roddick famously said, if you think being small can't make a difference, try and go to bed with a mosquito in the room. You know, it's up to each one of us to make a difference, and we can make that difference, absolutely. We arrived at South Georgia 100 years after Shackleton. It is a forbidding place to arrive. For us, it had taken a terrible toll on our team. Many of the people were physically broken. They had frostbite where their toes were black and shriveled from the excesses of standing in one degree Celsius seawater in hypothermic conditions on board a small boat 
battling your way through the Southern Ocean. It wasn't ideal. We got there. South Georgia threw the worst weather that can possibly be thrown at you, 85 knot winds as we clung on for survival in our wet cotton smocks, leather boots, and woolens on the beach of South Georgia. For five days, the winds ravaged past us, blew all of our tents away. Everybody looks at you as the expedition leader saying, what happens next? In some situations, the only thing one can do is do something. Sometimes when you're faced with such an overwhelming challenge, just doing something is the best course of action. For us, it was heading off into the mountains, even though the weather was still bad before the wheels of the whole expedition fell off. And I sometimes feel that, that again is a metaphor for climate change. We're faced with this enormous challenge, and sometimes that challenge can be completely overwhelming and paralyzing. And the key thing is do something. And there are many things one can do as an individual. Leaving aside voting, you can eat less meat, you can walk to work, you can cycle, you can put solar panels on your roof, you can uh, adjust your energy plan to a green plan with just a phone call. You can do the same in your workplace. There is a website you can go to that's unambiguously called Do Something. You can put in your postcode, you can say the kind of things you're interested in doing and how much time you can give and they will align you with a project that you can actually meaningfully influence. And it's up to each one of us to find the project that means something and get on with the business of doing it. I've been involved very heavily with the United Nations Climate Change Talks, and I remember back in December 15 when they struck a new climate deal for the world, where the media celebrated the fact that we'd reached $10 billion in the Green Climate Fund, the fund set aside for the world to combat the issue of climate change. And it sounds impressive. But $10 billion is one eight thousand five hundredth of global GDP. The good news in Australian super that all of you have, or many of you have, many of you will have, it's compulsory by the way, we have 250 times the funds in Australian super that the United Nations, which represents the interests of all the countries in the world, have in the Green Climate Fund, the funds specifically set aside to combat the issue of climate change. You can change where that money is invested with a phone call. There's every chance that you will earn far more money in your super fund if you invest it in impact investing in ethical funds than you would in a basket of normal funds. So you're not only saving the world, you're earning a buck to boot. Pretty good going. Shackleton deserves the final word. His goal was to save all his men from Antarctica. Our goal is to save Antarctica from man. Thank you.